Often people ask me to describe what leaders do really well. Uh, we, we sometimes know what they are, but but what is it that they do that really makes them effective? What is it that leaders do that set them apart from other people? I, I think that's the question. And so I would like to share with you in our little kind of monthly mentoring time, I'm so glad to be with you again. I would like to share with you four things that I have observed and noticed that that really good leaders do really well. And what's so, so beautiful is I pass this on to you this month, you're going to be able to do these. Uh, there's nothing I'm going to give you now that's beyond you, um, that you can't do, that that you know that that's kind of like unreachable. So let, let me give them to you, and and then let's uh, kind of apply it to your life for a moment. Number one, uh, leaders they they live what they say. Uh, Gandhi, he he made this statement. I think it's powerful. He said, "Be the change that you want to." see in the world. In other words, if he says you, you want to make a, the world a better place as a leader, you make the changes necessary to make the world a better place. In other words, you go first. What do leaders do? They go first. Leaders know the way. They go the way. They show the way. This is very essential in your leadership. It's very essential in my leadership. So, when leaders come to me and they say, I want to lead really well, I tell them, just live out the leadership that you want your people to have. Uh, it's easy to teach people what to do. It's easy to teach leadership. It's more difficult to show leadership. In fact, I, I often say that um, my greatest, people ask me, say, John, what is your greatest challenge as a leader? Well, my greatest challenge as a leader Obviously, it's quite simple, is it's leading myself. It's, it's much easier for me to come on monthly and tell you what to do as a leader. It's much more difficult for me to make sure that's what I'm doing as a leader myself. And, and so great leaders, uh, they, 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 they talk leadership, but they walk leadership. And when you start walking leadership, that's when you really begin to to be effective in your leadership. So number one, that they, they really live what they say. Number two is that uh, they constantly lift up their people. Um, their people look at them and they just basically say, my life is better because of that leader. You see, um, there are two types of leaders. There's the, there's the type that pushes the people down around him or her. Uh, so that they can be seen or because they can look better. And, and so what they do is they have to reduce the people around them so that they make themselves look bigger than life. But what I learned is that when you push people down, guess what happens? Honestly, you go down with them. You have to keep pushing, so you have to keep going lower yourself. But when you begin to lift people up, you, you raise them, but you raise yourself. So you want to be a lifter. You want to be a, a person that when they look at you as a leadership, they just say, my life is better because of that person. The third thing that I think leaders do really, really well is that they love the people that they, that they lead. In other words, um, in fact, I think they love the people they lead more than they love leading the people that they lead. It goes back to the fact that um, as a leader, you have to ask yourself, why do I lead people? What is my motivation? Why, why am I in the leadership game? And uh, leaders that love people, uh, they're contagious and the people feel that. They, they feel connected with them. They feel drawn to them. They feel attracted by them. And so I, I just challenge you in, in your time, in your monthly time, you really want to, um, you want to, to love the people that you lead more than you love leading them. When that's the fact, then you'll also lead them better because you'll always look out for their best interest. You'll always put them before yourself. You'll always serve them very, very well. And then there's one other area that um, uh, 
leaders just excel in that kind of sets them apart and stands them apart from anyone else, and that is that leaders lead well in difficult times. Uh, They are at their best when the times are at their worst. Um, You see, it's difficult times, it's adverse times that leaders are mostly needed. I mean, when things are going well, I mean, how much do you really need a leader anyway? But it's during the, 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 the confusing times. It's, it's during um, times of adversity that you really need some leader to be with him. And I tell leaders that during the difficult times, um, the, the best leadership you can do is, is, is to walk beside them. There's a tremendous security in, in having your leader, not you know miles ahead of you, but walking beside you. And by walking beside you, there's a support and a security and a, and a peace and, and a, a partnership and relationship that really makes the leadership work and, and really makes it vital. You know, during difficult times, I, I think there are three things that leaders really do well that makes them be that leader that gives security to the people. And, and, and those three things are courage, I think uh, people during difficult times uh, rely on the courage of of a leader. You know, Winston Churchill, during the World War II, when London would be bombed at night, the first thing he would do in the morning when he would literally come out of his bunker is he would go to the bombing spots in in London, and, and he'd have his photographers there, and he would be smoking a cigar, walking among the ruins, waving to the people. And he was basically saying, oh yeah, they knocked down some buildings last night, but it's okay, we're gonna make it, we're gonna, we're gonna survive. He, he visually showed courage to the people. I think they need commitment. They need commitment from you that you're not gonna leave them, that you're gonna hang in there, that, that you're gonna do everything in your power to uh, make sure that they get to the end, that you don't know what tomorrow's gonna look like, but you're gonna be with them tomorrow. And then I think they, they need clarity. Not clarity about the future, but clarity about your leadership. The fact that you're, it's an honor to lead them during difficult times, and that it's an honor to uh, experience adversity with them, knowing that it was gonna make you both better in that entire process. So as as you begin to think about leading well, just think of those four things I shared with you that leaders really do well. They live what they say. They lift up the people around them. They love the people that they lead. And they lead well in difficult times. So for the next month, just look at those four and ask yourself very simply, um, how well do I do in those areas? And which one? Hey, which of the four... Do I excel in and which one of the four can I improve in? All right, so you've inter- interviewed countless other successful leaders. You talked a little bit before we, we started recording about some of the athletes that mm. you have been able to interview and highlight in your career. What are, maybe you won't even tell a couple of those stories, but what are the common traits or the common practices that you've observed in, in some of these incredible high-performing individuals? Probably the, the, the number one trait that really uh, it would have surprised people is that the better they are, the more humble they are. The better they are, the more they realize, uh, the more self-aware they are and the ability to, to, to want to try to continue to grow. Um, you know, we were talking about it before we got started here that uh, we're sitting here at Willow Creek and, and just literally less than five miles away, um, maybe one of the big moments in my career occurred when um, uh, a gentleman by the name of Walter Payton. Yeah. Uh, Walter was the greatest running back and the greatest football player in the history. Sorry for the Green Bay Packer fans that are in here, but <laughs> greatest football player in the history of the game. Uh, Walter was 46 years old, um, had uh, developed a cancer that um, was inoperable. He knew it, the world did not. And he called and asked me if I would live with him for the last few weeks of his life to tell his story uh, in a book that we wrote together. You see how nonchalant he says that? He, he called me and asked me to live with him for a few weeks. With him. Well, Some people, favor's not fair. <laughs> I didn't deserve it, right? <laughs> Favor doesn't, isn't always deserved either, right? And, uh, but Walter gave me this opportunity, and um, uh, it was game-changing for me. 
Because from that moment on, many other people who were very successful in the world believed that if Walter Payton would trust you, I can trust you too. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes in life, someone gives you a break. Someone gives you a chance. And um, my, my chance happened not very far from here, which is why when, when Mark said, you get to, you, which one of these cities do you want to go to? No, no offense to all the other cities, but I wanted to come home, wanted to, come home to Chicago. This is, uh, this is it. You called it early. I, I'm sorry. You called Atlanta, it early. Houston and Florida. We love you. We love you. Hey, so let's go into this just a little bit more on these high performers. I want, I want to extrapolate out from your experience. I, I watched something the other day. I need to send this to you. I watched something about a week and a half ago. Uh, I was in Romania, and somebody sent me a video of an interview with Kobe Bryant. You may have seen it. And there were, there were, it was nine and a half minutes of brilliance. Nine and a half minutes of brilliance. But one of the questions was, what did it feel like when you lost? Hmm. Without blinking an eye, he said, it excited me. He said, because much of my life, I was one of the top performers. And when I found a game, a person, or an environment that I couldn't beat, it meant that I had more ahead of me that I could win and that I could accomplish. He said, losing was exciting. Isn't that brilliant? It is brilliant, and, and, and it's impossible. Most of us will not, most of us mere humans, right, uh, struggle, uh, you know, when we, when we think of how to handle those moments. Um, you know, right now, we're actually doing a book club uh, with, uh, with the Maxwell team, right? Yeah. Some of you are on it. Awesome. And, um, uh, and it's based on a book that I did in which I, it, I over the course of a career, I've asked 2,500 times, some of the greatest champions of our lifetime, if you could name for me the habit that you believe you developed into your daily routine that most changed and made a difference between you and others, what would the habit be? Wow. And the number one answer was that the truly great learn to hate losing more than they love winning. That winning is, as Kobe was saying there, right? Winning is almost what really successful people kind of expect from themselves. Yep. Losing should hurt. Yep. And too many people make excuses when they lose. Too many people have someone to blame when they lose. They have, they have a, a they, they, it's, the, it's the surface, it's the, uh, it's the referee, it's whatever it is. It's not me. The great ones say, guess what? I got to go get better. And, um, and when, then when the best are committed to going and getting better, um, then it's amazing the distance you can put between yourself and others. Staying on this Kobe Bryant video. Yeah, you can give him a hand on that. That was brilliant, brilliant. Staying with this Kobe Bryant video, he said that when he started realizing that he wanted to be one of the greats in the world, he said he looked at his ranking. He was 14 years old. He looked at his ranking. He said, I, was no, he said I wasn't even really on the chart. He said, I was number 64, and I went, well, I never was in the top 100, so I don't know what you mean, not on the chart. He said, I was number 64. He said, but what I decided to do is I listed the top 63, and I made an art of studying them to find out why they were ahead of me. He said, and then all year long, I began to check them off, check them off. I'm better than him on that. I'm better than him on that. I'm better than him on that. And he said, I worked myself all the way down to the top five by checking people off because of what they were good at that I wasn't good at yet. Mm. Now, staying with that, there's this, John, John Maxwell talks about getting out of the people pile. And if you haven't watched John talk about that lately, he, his dancing is one thing. Him oh, getting out please, of the people Lord. pile is a whole nother level. Uh, we'll have to get him to do that on the podcast sometime on video, by the way. That'll bring a lot of YouTube viewers. So getting out of this people pile a lot of times is this remarkable competitive spirit. So you've studied some of the most, the greatest, most accomplished competitors in the world. What do you see and what have you learned regarding competition in these great leaders? That they run toward it. You know, we hear that a lot about first responders and the great ones are the ones that run toward, right? And then Kyle Carpenter, the people who are willing to, to dive on the grenade, you know, to save the person next to them. The people that run toward, the great competitors want to run into the competition, right? Yeah. They, they're not looking to sit on the bench. They're not looking for that moment when they're not hoping that you don't ask them to take the shot. The great ones want to be in the mix, 
And I think that that's, um, uh, that's, that's really, that was really educational for me because there are times in life when you just don't feel it, uh-huh. right? And you, you, the great ones don't have a day when not feeling it is their reason to not want to be in the fray. Yeah. So I love that, right? I love that. That's what Kobe, Kobe was running toward it, right? He was running toward the 63 ahead of him. Uh, Michael Jordan, we'll, we'll throw a little Michael in here. Michael loves... Mike, Michael is the most competitive human I've ever met in my life. I've never, um, I mean, if, if it's tiddlywinks, that guy is trying to, he's trying to figure out how to beat you at it. Um, but it's the, the great ones are always looking for a way to run toward an opportunity to, to measure themselves. And they often find themselves in measuring, you know. And there's, for Michael, one of the challenges for Michael and Kobe and so is that after a while, it gets to a place where you almost don't feel there's anybody you can measure yourself against. And so then you have to measure yourself against you. And that's what they're, it's the daily improvement, right? It's that daily improvement. So you've told me a story and I'm putting you on the spot in Chicago on a podcast. I can fix this post edit. So we got it. Can you tell that story of Michael Jordan and you and competitor? I mean, really, do I have to? Come on. <laughs> so Michael Jordan does an old man basketball camp. He invites 100 old guys. It's an amazing collection. The only thing the 100 of us have in common is that we love to play basketball. I love basketball so much. I live in Florida. I have a full basketball court at my house, right? I love the game. And guys play there several nights a week. It's an awesome way, if you're old like me, to get your energy out. And um, Jordan invites 100 guys, divides us into teams of 10, brings in great coaches, and then, he, uh, and then over the course of, of several days, you'll play against each other for a championship. Well, Jordan, on the third day, he picks 20 guys and says, today you're going to get the opportunity to go one-on-one with the greatest player of all time. <laughs> How awesome is that, right, Jordan? you be able to call yourself greatest of all time. And, and, he, and he walks through, picks 20 guys out. I happen to be one of the 20. He says, by the way, he says, the rules are very simple. In fact, so simple, let me let my assistant explain them. His assistant steps up and she says, yes, the rules are simple. Today, you're going to play a game to one. First guy to score wins, right? First game to one, first guy to score wins. But Michael Jordan is going to start with the ball. (laughs) Your job is to guard Michael, she says. She even does the air quotes, right? And if Jordan doesn't score, you get the ball. Michael Jordan guards you. First guy to score wins. So Jordan steps up and says, while you're thinking about this, I want you to know I've done this little competition for nine years, and in nine years, five guys have ever scored on me. And today, there's not going to be a sixth. <laughs> if he needs the help, he's in your head, right? Well, two guys in front of me, the guy walks up. He goes to guard Michael Jordan, right? He goes to throw his elbow in Jordan's chest, but he only can get to his hip because he's not that tall. <laughs> And Jordan then takes the ball. He ball swipes the guy. The guy falls backwards. Jordan, one dribble, two steps, thunder dunk, pulls the ball out of the net. And as he walks by, our fallen colleague, Jordan, chucks the ball on him. And he says, now you know what it's like to be spanked like a bad child. Right? <laughs> greatest trash talker in the history, I'm telling you. History of the game, Michael Jordan, greatest trash talker. Two guys later comes me, and I decide when I go out there, uh, I'm going to step back and dare Michael Jordan to take a shot from the outside. And uh, there's a picture that we show sometimes when I tell him the story. Michael Jordan's got the ball in his left hand with his right hand. He's calling me out. And he looks at me and he goes, are you really going to give me this shot? And I looked back at Michael and I said, I don't think you have it in you. A <laughs> hundred old guys start laughing, right? Jordan then shakes his head, goes up, takes his shot and misses ball goes wide left I got the rebound took it back outside the three-point line and Jordan steps out to guard me and as he's stepping out I look back and I said Michael aren't you going to return the favor (laughs) and he said I'm I said I know you don't have that shot in you right and as Jordan stepped up I stepped back and from 26 feet became the sixth player to ever score on Michael Jordan And I'm sorry I was forced to tell that story one more time today. I, but I do my, I, when I see Jordan these days at different events, he always says, you still telling that story? <laughs> every day, Michael, I tell it every day. If someone gives me an open door, I tell that story. It's my fault, sorry, Michael Jordan. Sorry, post It's my fault. It's my but, fault. Uh, yeah.
So my second attempt was a reluctant leader. And then John comes after this and says, okay, now that you're leading, leaders see more Mm -hmm. and say more and feel more than others see. So when did you begin to see more and say more in your own life? And how has that led to where you are today? Yeah, well, you know, when it comes to seeing more, you know, I'll be doing a talk right after this podcast here. And and one of those principles in becoming more is that you have to see more, getting that crystal clear vision of what it is that you want. But as I was exposed to a couple different things, as I was exposed to more books, as I was exposed to more videos, as I was exposed to more events and environments, that's when I began to really see, hey, there is more. You know, there's a phrase that I I love to say all the time, and it's simply two words, why not? But those words, why not, are simply me looking at something and going, well, why not? You know, oftentimes we look at something and go, well, why does someone get to do this? Or why can't I have this? And what? But it opens up my mind and open up my eyes every single time. Doesn't matter what's happening, what it is that I want, what it is that I desire. If I can just answer the question, why not? That really moves me in that direction. So for me, I've always been a, a visual person of let me see it, sense it, let me get inside the environment and, you know, let it become part of my life. And so it's a principle I believe I picked up very early to become who I am. Well, and, I, and I'll tell you this, getting a chance to work alongside you and work a, alongside John Maxwell, that you get in environments like we have at Maxwell Leadership yeah. under John's shadow and you can't help but lead. Right. right? Yeah. <laughs> and then, as you know, and you and I have had some side-by-side leadership opportunities to lead through difficult times. And that ability to see more and see before. Podcast family, I was telling our team just right before uh, we started recording today, yesterday I had a really difficult, very challenging leadership environment. You, yeah, you were yeah. with me, yeah. Chris. And, and there was a moment in the meeting where I felt like a plan was starting to come together that the team was starting to galvanize around the plan. And even though I knew over the coming days after that meeting that there were going to be some very tough decisions, tough conversations, the leader in me sit back and started going, wow, this is starting to feel good. Emotionally, it didn't feel good. From a personal standpoint, it didn't feel good. But the leader in me, you know why? Because leaders can get above their emotion and see the solution as the plan starts coming together. And that is a ticket that I want to extend to all of you going through a difficult times. Remember, difficult times reveal you. They don't make you. You're already made. They're going to reveal you. So how do we respond at that time? And we begin to click that or turn that corner, click that switch to where we can see more and before. Yeah, absolutely. Being a dealer of hope. And that kind of leads into number four when you're, as you're assessing yourself, where he talked about, there are two ways to face the future from a different mindset. And one is apprehension, apprehension, and one is anticipation. And John talks so often about how he anticipates. And I know that you anticipate, but for me, this was a big shift because I feel like I I had anticipation, but right up to the moment, I would start to feel uh, ap- apprehension. And what I found was, and I learned this from John, I learned this from working it through with you, was that I was thinking too much about me and what people were going to think of me. And was I going to deliver it correctly? And how are they going to perceive me? And were they going to believe that I was being sincere enough? All of that is me, me, I was thinking about me and not thinking about the other people and how I could serve them and how I could lead them well. And so I'm just curious, did you ever have this shift or was this something where you were always somebody who who looked upon the future with anticipation or was there ever a time when you looked upon the future with apprehension? Yeah, so I am by nature I, I definitely anticipate. I definitely don't have the apprehension piece. Now, I have filled several roles, even with John Maxwell here at Maxwell Leadership, that required me to anticipate apprehensive things. What if this goes wrong? What if the challenge? And I found that when I was anticipating apprehension, if you'll allow me to use both words, that I was anticipating what could go wrong, I found that it muddled my judgment. 
But if I went in and allowed my anticipation to exhibit hope and potential rather than destruction, opportunity rather than doors closing, I found that I exhibited better judgment over time. Let me illustrate this with a conversation I just had with my 17-year-old, soon-to-be 17-year-old. Macy was was coming in, and, and she she's really does well in a, all of her subjects. But let me not be an overdoting dad. She has a couple that she is pretty good at, and she just over she, over a period of time, she is six, eight, ten, fifteen points ahead of a lot of people in her class. Yet when it comes, she's in finishing up eleventh grade, starting as a senior in high school. When it comes test time. Macy gets very apprehensive. And what happens is, is people that she consistently throughout the year scores better than them by double digit points, they will score equal to her or greater than her on a end of the year exam. So we're talking through that. I said, Macy, what goes on in your head? She said, what goes on in my head is the apprehension of what if I forget something that I remembered is what if I don't do well? And so we started walking through this, and I said, Macy, what if you took a test with the anticipation that said, this test is going to show what I know. This test is going to be able to demonstrate my knowledge rather than to perhaps demonstrate my ignorance. And she said, Dad, I have never done that with anticipation. I've never taken a test and went, watch what this test does to demonstrate what I know. I've always looked at a test to say, oh, my, it terrifies me at what I might not know. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, now it's summer, so we'll see if I can rec- recreate this lesson when it's test time. But w- w- it was like a light bulb went on in my 17-year-old's mind when she went, I always look at tests apprehensive at what I don't know rather than anticipating what showing what I do know. I think in leadership, many of us stymie or paralyze at best, or at worst maybe, our leadership by being apprehensive when we walk into a difficult situation rather than with anticipation. Because let me tell you this, leadership is only needed in the difficult and in the uncertain. If everything was certain and everything was easy, leaders, you're not needed. It's when things are difficult or things that are uncertain where leadership really is felt and needed. So leaders, here's a suggestion, quit being apprehensive about the difficulty and start anticipating the difficulty so you can show off your leadership stuff. Go show your leadership and anticipate rather than being apprehensive. That's right. That's right. And it all comes down to choice. It's the same Macy. She knows the same information. It's the same test. It's the same questions. She has the same amount of information, but it's how she approaches it. It's her choice. It's a mindset. And we can do that too. And that leadership, it starts with leading ourselves first. Let's get started. What you visually see in front of you now are the five levels of leadership. In a moment, I'm going to start at the very bottom, the position level, and I will slowly work from the position level, clear up to number five, which is what we call the pinnacle level. But we're going to take our time, because it does take time, and we're going to process it, and we're going to learn that every step of the journey increases and compounds our leadership effectiveness, and we're going to learn that we become a part of each step and we build on the steps that are beneath us. I'm excited. So let's go to level number one. As you can see, it's the lowest level of leadership. It's called the position level. In the position level, the key word is rights. In other words, you get a job, you get a title, and in your leadership position, you have certain rights that allow you to lead others. At this level, people follow you because they have to. What do I mean? You're the supervisor. People that come and become a part of the organization, they come underneath of you. You're the leader. They follow you because they have to. 
They don't necessarily follow you because you're good. They follow you because you are over them. Now, when I talk about the position level, I want you to know, first of all, that's how we all start. We all start by getting a leadership position. But the position doesn't make the leader. The leader makes the position. And we become very limited at this level if we think that our title and our privileges and our rights really are what makes us a good leader. They're not. Now, the flip side of this, that's level one, this position level, is an exciting level to be on, and let me tell you why. If I have a leadership title or position, it gives me an opportunity to what? To lead. And how do I become a better leader? By practicing leadership. So when I look at level one, I smile real big because I used that level as a time to practice leadership, not as a time to protect my leadership. I use it as a time to, to learn and grow and ask questions which make me a better leader. I didn't use the fact that I had a title and so people had to follow me as the result of me being a good leader. Be, be honest with yourself. If people have to follow you, you don't know if you're a good leader or not. The people don't have any choice. So when I look at the position of leadership, I look at it as it's an opportunity to learn. For example, when you became part of the secret team, one of the things I love about your organization is immediately it gives you a position or a place to lead. You're to go out and share their story and, and find people and recruit people and bring them on your team. And guess what? You, you almost immediately become a leader. What I want you to know is that that's a good thing. But use your early days in secret to just practice leadership because the more that you practice, the better that you're going to get. Now, when I talk to you about level number one, the position level, please understand that the reason you don't want to stay on level one is it is extremely limited. Let me explain. If the only reason people follow you is because you're above them, you have a position above them, if the only reason they follow you is because they don't have any choice, that's what they got to do, then you have to understand that they may not give you the effort that they need for them to succeed or for you to succeed. Let's put it this way. If I have to follow someone that maybe isn't even a good leader, but they're over me, there's nothing inspiring about that. I, in fact, I, I may say, wow, <laughs> I don't even care for the leader that got over me. And, and, and so therefore, at level number one, what happens is, as a leader, you don't get the energy that you need from your people to be successful. And the people that are following you aren't willing to give you that energy. No one has ever built a great team on low energy. No one has ever built a great team on low commitment. No one has ever said, you know, let me tell you something. The reason my business has succeeded is that nobody cares. Nobody has ever said the reason I've made a lot of money is because I didn't want to. No one's ever said the reason I have a great relationship is because I don't put anything into it. No, no, no. You see, everything that's good, everything that's important takes commitment and effort. That's why I teach people all the time that everything worthwhile is uphill. Well, the problem with level number one, the position level, is if people follow you not because you're good, but because they have to, they're not sure they're going to go uphill with you. And the only way you're going to succeed is getting them and you to go uphill together. So I think I've said enough about level number one. I, I, think, you've, I, I think you've got it. I, I think you understand that level number one is where you start. And it's a great place to start because you got to practice leadership. And that's what's so great about secret. They're just letting you practice leadership literally every day. And that makes you a better leader. But you don't stay on level one very long because it's incredibly unlimited and people really won't give you the energy you need to build this incredible business.
So, hey, here's the good news. There's another level above you, and you can get to it. That's level number two, and I call it the permission level. Let me tell you why I give it the title, the permission level. This level is all about relationships. And when I think of relationships, when you're a level two leader, the people that follow you give you permission to lead them. Wow, that's different than level one. They didn't have any choice in their leader in level one. But at level two, they give you permission to lead them. Why? Because they like you. And even better, you like them. So now you're beginning to develop a relationships and watch this. At level number two, people follow you because they want to. There is a world of difference between people following you because they have to and people following you because they want to. And what is that difference? Very simple. Energy. At level number two, when you grow and develop your leadership to be a permission leader, what you'll find immediately from the people on your team is you get much more energy. Why? Because they like you. You like them. You like being together. You like working together. You like doing projects together. You like taking the hill together. It's all because you like each other. And energy is immediately infused in people when they like their leader. Why? Because you're inspiring them. You're bringing the best out of them. Now, as I talk about level two, three, and four, these middle three levels, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you at each level so that we can be practical, so that you can have some, some good, tangible things to kind of put your hands on. I'm going to talk to you about Three things that leaders do well at each one of these three middle levels. So at the permission level, for example, one of the things that leaders really do well is they listen well. They have not only an open door policy in their leadership, they have an open ear policy. They walk slowly through the crowds. They truly want to hear from you because they truly value you. You see, positional leaders, they don't want to hear from you. They want you to hear them. They're top down in their thinking. On level number two, now we're walking slowly through the crowd. And as leaders, we want to listen. In fact, there's a process that the permission leader goes through at level two. They basically, they, they listen, they learn, and only then do they lead. You see, they have no desire just to tell you what to do. They have a desire to find you, to know where you are. This relationship level is all about me asking you questions, me understanding you, me caring for who you are and and what you want to do, and listening to your dreams, and, and understanding your motivations. And it's all about relationships. And this begins to strengthen not only the bond between the leader and the team, but it heightens the energy level. I can share with you without any doubt that listening really helps you to be a strong relational leader. When I was a young leader, sadly, I didn't listen very well. In fact, uh, it was a, a eureka moment for me when, when one day one of my staff members said, John, you don't listen well. And I began to realize I had a blind spot there. And, and, and I was, as a young leader, I was full of passion and vision and direction. And I was always telling people where I wanted them to go and when we wanted to go and get on the leadership train. And I was all directional. And, and over the years, I, I've learned that that instead of giving directions, I ought to be asking questions. Level two permission le uh, leaders, that's what they do. They're asking questions, they're building relationships, and they're increasing that energy. So, a level two leader, they listen well. Secondly, they observe well. They watch their people. And by the way, they can watch their people because they're with their people. 
And as they watch, as they listen, they begin to see really who the people are that are on their team. Let me explain that. You see, if you just listen to people, they may tell you what you, they want you to hear. But when you watch and observe people, you're going to find out really quickly if their actions back up their words. You see, their words are a statement of what they want to become, but their actions underline that statement. Or if their actions match their words, then their actions underline the statement. And if the actions don't match their words, their actions cross out that statement. Wow, that's huge. So either my actions are underlining what I'm saying or they're crossing out what I'm saying. And level two leaders understand that, so they watch their team players. It's, it's like Coach Wooden, who was my mentor for so many years, the greatest coach in college basketball, 10 national championships, voted by Sports Illustrated, the greatest coach of the last century. And Coach Wooden would look at his ball players and he would say, don't tell me what you're going to do. Show me what you're going to do. A level two permission relationship leader watches the actions of the people and it's their actions that determines how he or she leads them, not their words. I lead my people based upon what they do, not based upon what they say. There's one other quality of a permission le uh, leader that I need to share with you quickly. Is, is they, they not only listen well and they not only observe well, but the third thing they do is they serve well. And this is a major difference between levels two and one. If I'm a level one position leader, I don't serve at all. You serve me. I'm over you. You take care of me. That position totally turns around at level two. At level two, I serve you. I add value to you. I do everything in my power to lift up you. It's the spirit, the attitude that takes a person and gives them what I call serving actions. In my organizations, people will tell me sometimes because the John Ant Maxwell Enterprise has many companies. People will come up to me that I don't even know and they'll say, I, I just got hired by one of your companies. And, well, good, nice to meet you, nice to meet you. And then they'll say something like, I, I work for you. And I stop, I say, no, 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 no. You, you don't work for me. I, I don't have slaves. You work with me. In fact, I, I work with you. I'll serve you. You serve me. Let's serve each other. We're not position conscious at all. We just want to add value to each other. A permission level leader that is strong in relations, they listen well, observe well, and they serve well. Well, as you become a good relational permission leader, you can now go up to the third level of leadership, and that is the production level. And... This is an incredible level to be on because the key word at this level is results. What do I mean by that? Well, at this level, people follow you because of what you have done for the organization. In other words, you are a person that is helping grow the organization. You know how to produce. Now, this is essential, and in fact, I tell people all the time, you really don't know you're a good leader until you get to level three. You see, at level one, you don't know you're a good leader or not because you just have a position and people are only following you because they have to. At level number two, just because people like you at that permission level doesn't really mean that you lead well, it just means that they like you. So level two could be as much about relationships and friendship as it could be about leadership. But let me tell you something. When you get to level three and you produce, as you're taking notes on this lecture, I think a word that you want to make sure you put right now in your notes section is credibility. You get credibility in your ability to produce. In other words, the only reason that I have a right to ask you to follow me 
is that I'm good, that I know how to be successful. Think about it for a moment. You shouldn't follow me because I have tenure in an organization and I have had a lot of experience. You shouldn't follow me because I have a title. I mean, no one ever followed a title to success. Nobody ever followed somebody that's been in the company a long time and hasn't produced a success. You see, people do what people see. If I produce, you begin to see that success in my life, which now begins to be contagious because I cannot give to you what I don't have. So if I can't produce, I can't train you to produce, ah, won't work. So level three, I tell people all the time when they say, oh, I, I want to be a leader, John. I don't want to really be a good leader. I said, it's very simple, produce. Produce results. If you can have growth in your team and in your organization, you will be a level three leader. And not only will you be a level three le leader, everybody will want to follow you. See, at level two, they want to be around you, but level number three, they want to be like you. Because now you're helping people to go to an entirely new level. And at level number three, the production level, there are three things, just like at the permission level, there are three things that production leaders do very well. Number one, they lead by example. Production leaders absolutely know how to show people what to do. Their favorite words are, follow me. And so level three leaders visualize success continually. People at level three that are following that type of a leader, they don't need to wonder about what success is. They see it around them all the time. They, they experience it in the leader. This is just absolutely huge. People do what people see. That's the greatest motivational principle in the world. Leadership is highly visual. No one ever followed a leader that they never met or can't see. When you begin to show results, you begin to create the culture of your team being productive. Productive people reproduce productive people. Unproductive people reproduce unproductive people. So level three is the credibility that you have as a leader and you basically say, okay, I will be the example. Watch me, follow me. But the second thing that production leaders do really well is they not only lead by example, but they create momentum. And they create momentum by producing. You see, there are momentum makers in an organization and there are momentum breakers. The momentum makers are the ones that continually build and add value and produce. And by the way, momentum is something you want to have as a leader because it's the leader's best friend. In fact, I call momentum the big mo. You want to have momentum because it's a great exaggerator. What I mean by that is it takes everything you do and it makes it better and bigger than it actually is. You see, when, when you are effective and you can produce, it begins to exaggerate your worth. It begins to exaggerate what your team is doing. It's a positive, by the way, positive momentum gives you positive exaggeration and negative momentum gives you negative exaggeration. It'll either make you look better than you are or to be honest with you, it'll make you look worse than you are. Now, the greatest problem solver that you'll ever have in your business is momentum. Momentum will solve 80% of your problems. Let me explain what I mean by that. A train on a track going down that track 55 miles an hour. If on that track there's a five foot thick concrete wall, a, a, a big barrier, okay? On that track, that train with the momentum at 55 miles an hour will hit that barrier, crash it and keep on moving. Why? It had momentum. The obstacle couldn't stop the momentum. Same train, same track, no momentum, stop dead. If you put a one inch block in front of the driving wheel, the train can't get started. Isn't it interesting? Same train, with momentum, crashes through a steel reinforced concrete wall, bang, moves it out of the way, no momentum, one inch block, can't go anywhere. You see, 
If you don't have any momentum in your company, in your organization, on your team, a one-inch problem is a real problem. You can't even get going. You lack momentum. A one-inch problem is keeping you from going. But if you have momentum, a five-foot thick concrete steel reinforced wall problem can't stop you. That's why I tell people all the time that your problem isn't your problem. The problem is you think the problem is a problem. And so the problem that's not a problem becomes a problem, not because it's a problem. The problem is you didn't know the problem wasn't a problem. And since you didn't know the problem wasn't a problem, the problem that wasn't a problem has become a problem, not because it was a problem, but the problem was that you didn't know it wasn't a problem. And so the problem that wasn't a problem has become a problem until you now have a real problem. That wears me out. And I know it's wearing you out because you're trying to write everything down and you melancholics are saying, raising your hands. Come on, John, repeat that. I, I don't think I got every problem in there. Don't worry about it. Listen to me. I'm just telling you, my name's John. I'm your friend. And when you're at level number three, you solve your problems by creating momentum. 80% of the problems you ever have on your team, if you're producing results, will go away. Trust me. The third thing that production leaders do they not only lead by example and create momentum, but they attract better people. Oh, I love this. The better you are as a leader, the better people you attract. Could I go back for a moment to that illustration I gave you a while ago? Uh, the leadership lid, remember I said, if, you're, if your leadership lid was a five, what is your business? It's a four, okay? Well, that's not only true in growing your company, that's true in attracting people to your team. If I'm a five leader, who will I attract to come on my team? Fours, threes, twos, and one. Who won't be attracted to join my team? Sevens, eights, nines, tens. Can, can I tell you in the history of mankind, it's never happened where a nine person was attracted to follow a five. Nines don't follow fives. They're already bigger, better, and faster than fives. If you're a five, you've got fours, threes, and twos, and ones on your team. If you're an eight, you've got seven, six. I, trust me. One of the reasons you want to get better as a leader is the moment that you get better as a leader and better as a producer, guess what? If you're a better producer, who do you attract? You attract better producers to you. Like begets like. We don't attract who we want. We attract who we are. That's absolutely huge. Well, I think we need to go over here quickly to level number four because it gets pretty exciting here, and I love it. So let's go up here to level number four, which is the people development level, and the key word here is reproduction. At this level, people follow you because of what you have done for them personally. Now, my goal in life as a leadership teacher is to get you to level four. I know there are five levels of leadership, but my goal is to get you to level four. I, if you get to level four, let, let me just say real quickly, level five will take care of itself. Level four is where I want to get you, and here's why. If level three gives you credibility to lead, because you produce results. Level four compounds, that's a good word for you, compounds, multiplies everything you do in leadership. In other words, level three you add, level four you multiply. It's at level four that you really set yourself apart from everyone else in the organization because now you're multiplying. And at level four, level four leaders do three things very well. They recruit very well. Now, why do they recruit very well? I've already said we attract who we are, not who we want. They have the ability to attract better people. And guess what? If you attract better people, you equip better people and you get better. The second thing that people, that leaders do on the people development fourth level 
is they also position their people well. They know how to place people to get the highest return out of their life. And the third one, I want to, I'm rushing to the third one because I don't want to miss it because it's so important, is that they not only recruit well and position well, at level number four, they equip people well. Wow. You see, if I could literally come off this screen and come into your life, I would really ask you two questions that will determine your success at Secret. The first question I would ask you is this. What are you doing to develop yourself? If you want to develop yourself as a leader better, I would encourage you to pick up my book, Developing the Leader Within You 2.0. But the second question I would ask you is, what are you doing to develop the people around you? In fact, my latest leadership book, The Leader's Greatest Return, is all about how you develop other leaders. Now, the way you develop leaders around you is by equipping them, and there's a five-step process to equipping them that if you will engage in, I promise you it will bring you success. And by the way, I know how to equip people. I have a nonprofit organization that has equipped five million leaders in every country of the world. We're the largest equipping organization in the world. And there's a simple five-step process that if you'll do this at secret, trust me, you will begin to multiply your success. The five steps, step one, I do it. Now, that has nothing to do with equipping. It just has everything to do with the credibility to equip. We've already talked about it. Step two, I do it, you're with me. The power of proximity. You're watching me. You're observing and learning from me. People do what people see. This is a wonderful stage of equipping. It's a visual closeness, the power of proximity. Stage three is you do it and I'm with you. After you've watched me and asked a lot of questions and learned, I say, okay, it's time for you to practice, and I begin to coach you. I begin to tweak you. This is where great growth happens. The greatest growth in the equipping process happens in stage three because you're getting to practice, and I'm there to, to make sure that you not only practice, but you practice right. Stage four is you do it. Now, most organizations stop with stage four, and that's a big mistake. The magic is in stage five, and at Secret, I want to encourage you, get to stage five and watch Secret just grow like it's never grown before. I'm so excited about this. I'm so excited for you. Watch this. Stage five is you do it, and somebody is with you. You've never equipped somebody until they've equipped somebody else, and that's where the multiplication begins. I equip you to equip other people. In fact, when I equip somebody, I never even start until I ask them, who will you equip when I'm finished with you? I always make sure that my equipping doesn't have a dead end. Well, there's the last stage. It's the pinnacle level of a leader. The key word there is respect, and people follow you because of who you are, and they follow you because of what you represent. At level number five, you are bigger than life. Trust me. And why are you bigger than life? Because you've done every level of leadership well. When you had the position of leadership, you didn't use it as entitlement and as a right. You used it as a time to practice leadership and become a better leader. When you got to the permission level, you took people believed in them, loved them, and relationally connected with them until they could hardly wait to do business with you. When you got to the third level, you didn't tell people what to do. You showed people what to do by producing. And your credibility and respect was in the fact that they knew they could follow you because you produced them, produced more than what they could produce. Level four, you developed people and raised up leaders until they began to multiply and compound your work. And guess what? The company gives you position number one. The people within the company give you position number five. Finding time for leadership. We all talk about not even having enough time in our calendar to do anything. And, mm -hmm. and now we are looking at this of saying, how do we find time can we? We're going to unpack this a little bit today 
to me, it's really about the availability for your team at the end of the day. And I think that's important as, as you work on a team. So, Perry, what drove this topic, this thought that we're going to be bringing to our listeners today? Yes, yes, yes. I was on a, a group coaching call. So we do this a lot. We'll, we may deliver a workshop, and then we group coach the executives, um, you know, eight or ten that were in the room. So I'm on the – it's a couple months out from the facilitation, and I always start the coaching call by saying, what's new in your leadership? What's going on in your leadership? What have you done since the last time we spoke? Uh, we made some decisions, and what have you done with that? Um, give me an update. And the uh, head head person on the call kind of rubs their head and goes, man, <laughs> it has been so busy. We have been heads down so busy, I haven't had time to leave. My head just about exploded, oh, but I, I held it together. I go, what? And uh, I, you know, I did use it as a coaching moment to say, listen, you are always leading either poorly or greatly, you, 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 whatever you're, you, people are watching, you're not, you don't get a break from this. And it got me to wondering what exactly gets dropped when you're too busy in your mind, too busy to lead. Yeah. And I wondered if you ever faced this, yeah. you're a busy dude. I was wondering, you know, do you, I don't see this in you. I feel like you're leading and being busy, but what, how does this re yeah. relate to you? So 100% do I struggle with this, right? Like, um, we, we can become a slave to our calendars, which is, mm -hmm. seems to be happening uh, certain times in my leadership. And when you asked that question, what came to my mind was, am I, am I a doer or a developer? Hmm. And I think we, we've talked a little bit about this maybe in the past, but it's where it came back from. I don't know if we were with a client and we had this conversation or the content. And I was like, am I just focused on being a doer or am I focused on being a developer? And when you put it in that lens, you go, if that's the case, I want to be a developer. I have to be a doer, but it's got to be in and through and with my people. That's right. Which is called leadership, mm -hmm. uh, which is called influence. And so, man, I 100% can can resonate with that, but it's not an excuse. And I think what was frustrating you about the experience you had was, well, first of all, we're in the leadership business, and so we're mm -hmm. like, huh. Oh. But I think what was frustrating was like th that's on you. Like we we have to be intentional about that if we want to develop people. And you and I believe that's the leader's greatest return that we right. could ever do is to develop people then to go and succeed as a leader. And so it is a real challenge. There's 100% and I deal with it, but you got to fight it every single day. Yeah, and I, I totally agree. I uh, fight the same battle. And it, to me, often comes down to, and we teach this in uh, in the five levels class, we ask, what's the difference between management and leadership? Mm. And we can go through, you know, back and forth about what that is, but uh, what I felt like the, this group was doing and what you and I uh, confess that we've struggled with, I spend all my time managing and not uh, actually leading. So I'm managing the process and the business and not really leading the people. But I'm going to, today, I, I wanted to review, you know, a certain number of things. You figure <laughs> out what the number is. Uh, of ideas about how you can move to um, making time for your leadership. But I'll tell you, just if you turn the podcast off now, here's what I want you to know. Uh, it is, you're not adding leadership is not adding new things to your calendar. And what my saying I've always, uh, as I've been learning about this was stop trying to add leadership to your calendar as like it's something new, but take what's on your calendar, make, make leadership moments of the things that are already on your calendar. Brilliant. So stop adding leadership as a separate entry into your calendar, but add leadership moments to the things that are on your calendar. That's brilliant. Like you can turn the podcast off right now. <laughs> that is a Twitter moment, hashtag Perry Holly quote. But I, you shared that with me right before we went live on this podcast. And I was like, Ooh, that statement is really, really, really deep. That's good. Well, and just a, you, the example we were just uh, giving that, that if you, if you have things on your calendar, like I was telling Chris, if he's going to go uh, down the hall to meet with our CEO, Mark Cole, and he, they're going to have a meeting that's scheduled about a 90-minute meeting on the 2024-2025 strategy, and he looks back around the, and he looks at a couple of his key players that are in their offices there, and he says, hey, I've got this meeting coming up this afternoon. I'd like for you to join me in that, and I don't want you to talk, sit up against the wall, take notes, whatever, but we'll, we're going to, we'll debrief it later. But I want you to see, uh, get a feel for how leadership works around here, how we plan, how we strategize. I want you to get a feel for how Mark works, how I work. 
And what you're doing there is you had an event on your calendar, a 90-minute call, and now you just made it a leadership moment by a, a, a leadership development moment or a, a strategy development. You, you gave a – there's a lot of benefit in doing that. Now, you can't invite – everybody to every meeting. Right. You, there's a lot of meetings that are private. You can't do that. But I'm just finding that I had a leader that did this once and it really struck me odd that he didn't miss everything on his calendar. He kind of looked at even lunch. Sometimes he said, Hey, yeah. come join me for lunch. I want to yeah. talk about your career. Okay. That's a leadership moment. It's a, it's a development moment. And, uh, that's so I think there's lots there. And I put down, you know, list said, what are the things that could be dropped? What are the actions of leaders? So, you know, vision and strategy, communicating, inspiring, uh, making decisions, delegating, uh, building relationships, coaching, mentoring, leading by example, um, monitoring, evaluating performance, handling challenges, uh, continuous learning. There's all kinds of things. Uh, there's way more than this uh, 12 that are on this list. Um, but what do you think gets dropped when you don't have time for leadership? Well, I'm a little concerned because I was excited about we might – we might have the number five in this lesson, but you started off with 12 points. I'm not sure where you're going with yeah. this. but <laughs> I just was trying to mess with you. You might have to listen to see if five shows up. But yeah. I think it's interesting. I do think there are – this is a list of 12. I think to your point, there's probably just a, a, a whole slew of other things that as actions of leaders that uh, we need to make sure that we're thinking about. If this list that you just talked about here, if you said to me, hey, what's the one – that if we dropped or, you know, would kind of maybe mess everything up. And it goes back to something that every single leader talks to us about when they're on the phone. And I think I experienced, not I think, I know I experienced, and I, and I know you experienced, and that is communication. Mm -hmm. If a leader cannot communicate, then, you know, what good is the vision? What good is the relationships, the expectations? There's all kinds of gaps inside there. And so, so for me, I think the word uh, communicating of this list of 12, I think that impacts every single other one as a leader that we need to make sure that we're focused on. So I do have five strategies. Yeah. Ah, there it is. There it is. Yes. <laughs> for this. But I, I want to make these practical. But let me tell you, the, the uh, overall big learning I already gave you was make moments of the things already on your calendar. Don't miss that. But here's some practical ideas, and I'm I really just I'm, I'm going to throw them at you one at a time. We'll move quickly, but um, they may sound insignificant, but I, I think for me they have been meaningful. Number one was the practice of uh, hmm. calendar blocking. Are you are you leaving your calendar wide open, or do you block it for important things? Why are you shaming your head down? <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like uh, I think I believe in that principle as a concept, and then I thought. Well, you, and then protect it. Oh yeah, right? yeah. because for me, <laughs> oh, blocking is easy. Part. I have good intentions. I'll put Perry. I'll put blocks all over my calendar, <laughs> did they, right? Did they vanish? But then all of a sudden, I'm like, well, Perry needs. Yeah, we need to connect. Yeah, then I need to okay, Jake, whatever. Like, you know. And all of a sudden, I'm like, well, I mean, it was on there Sunday night. I don't know what happened, you know. And so my thought was, man, yeah, do, to do that and protect it. I, I think you've got to be so intentional about this, and um, and then and communicate it to your team as well and just say, Hey, you know, I, I had the opportunity one time to have uh, lunch with a former Chick-fil-A executive. And we were, he was probably one of the first 10 Chick-fil-A employees and kind of helped build what it was, ran marketing mm -hmm. departments. And, and so I said, Hey, what was one of the keys to your career that you felt like you allowed you to think on the business, be in the business and all that stuff. And he goes, Oh, it's pretty simple. So I pull out my pen. I'm yeah. like, give it to me. He's like, Friday from 12 to 5, I blocked out my calendar and would not have a meeting, would not whatever. He said that was my time to reflect on the business from that week. What are we thinking about for the next week? It allowed me to spend some time, you know, really doing what I needed to do before I got to the weekend. Sometimes I had to work on the weekends or whatever, but then I was able to be with, present with my family on that. And so I thought, I thought, man, there's a guy that, led at a very, very high level for a long time. And every Friday from 12 to 5, he didn't have a meeting, didn't have a call, didn't have a – but it was on the business. And he said that's probably the best thing he had done for his mm, career really at Chick-fil-A as an executive. So, man, practice that calendar blocking like Perry's talking about and then protect, protect it. it. Yeah, that's yeah. my ad, protect I like it. That. I like yeah. that. Yeah. Number two was – and I think it helps with the blocking is – be. Be very clear about your priorities. Mm -hmm. uh, that to me was uh, there's a lot of things competing for your time. 
and and your people, your leadership, your business, all those types of things. But um, what's your decision making filter for that? It is your priorities and the ability to say no. Uh, which you and I both struggle with, is um, is Im- impeded by a lack of being clear on what it is we're trying to do. Yeah, I love this because I think if if you have too many things on there, um, you're not able to strategically allocate you know your calendar and your time for leading and and developing people. And as you come up with that list of priorities, as you talked about in decision making filter, my first comment is review it often. Mm-hmm. I just spent um, a couple weeks ago, I just spent a day away and was just, you know, some of the changes that we have in the organization and responsibilities and shifts. And so I, I blocked out the entire day and I, I got away and I just said, okay, what are my priorities? And then how do I communicate that to the team so that they're aware of that? And as I went through that, I, I, I noticed, man, I'm glad I'm reviewing this because of my priorities, because they're drastically different than what they were two months ago, three months mm-hmm. ago. And so one of the things in developing this strategy to set my calendar up is to be able to do that and make sure that maybe some things that are not as high of a priority don't make it on the calendar, which again, then goes back to as a leader, being able to find time for the people. Um, so yeah, I think that's key, but my add to you there is to review it uh, on a timely manner because it's going to change. It's right, going to well, change. I have a process. Every evening before I close down for the day, I use a 3x5 uh, index card to capture my three most important things for tomorrow, mm-hmm. looking at whatever's changed. I had a plan for the week, but where are we? What's changing? What do I need to be working on? And I start early, so I want to know. I don't want to be sitting at my kitchen counter you know, waiting on the coffee to brew, wondering what am I going to be doing uh, after I have my, my morning routine, what is the first thing I'm going to be mm, doing? I know it, the most important things first. And then I reassess that at the end of the day for tomorrow. And I've, I'm carrying that card with me right now. I know what, what I've, what's got coming up. Oh, this one's huge. So scheduling one-on-one meetings with the people on your team. I am stunned by the number of leaders in our coaching um, practice that, that either when I say this, think it's a new idea or, yeah, I used to, but I don't anymore. To me, this is fundamental to at least having that everybody on your team has knows they have time with you uh, each week or each two weeks that you, they have dedicated time with you. I see your head dropping again. I, <laughs> I'm with you. I can't believe how many men and women that are leading people that don't have regular one-on-ones. It doesn't have to be every week, and it doesn't have to be an hour and a half long. It It simply could be that it's every other week, it's 30 minutes, it's the agenda about them. How how in the world can you lead an organization or a team that the direction you want it to go in if you're not having, you know, regular one-on-ones? I, I was working with a close friend of mine who has a small organization that he's building and um, the structure of his leadership team grew faster than what the organization grew. And as we saw the organization growing he came to me and he's like i feel like we're a little off target we're a little off and i was like well how often are you meeting with your mm. key leaders he's yeah. oh, I, I leave that to my my general manager what i'm like wait a minute we're not running a hundred billion dollar business where you have different tiers of leadership like you got to be having one-on-ones and so i think even if you bring that down to a very small team they will capture your heart the vision the strategy if you're having these and so i don't know how people can go about not having this at least twice a month with their team. Yeah, I won't go back through the, the 12 that I listed things on leadership, but a lot of the 12 can be uh, can be compensated in that 30-minute one-on-one where you let people know you see them, you, you know them, you you listen to them. Uh, it's just fantastic. And, uh, and I know the last thing you're looking for is to attend another meeting. Mm-hmm. I know how you feel about meetings. But, I mean, it, you, you have to have these. These are yeah, that critical. One, that one I like because yeah. uh, it, it helps me stay connected. Yeah. Um, don't, don't get into me in meetings. Yeah. Number four, <laughs> John would call it walk slowly among the people. Uh, I'm old enough to know that it was called MBW, practice MBWA, management yeah. by walking around. Uh, but I don't have time to walk around, I hear you saying. Um Find creative ways to get out and walk through the office, walk through the plant. Uh, what if your team is remote? How do you walk mm. among the team when it's remote? Uh, might be scheduling those one-on-ones, might be catching a few minutes of how you're doing. Uh, what are your thoughts on MBWA? 
So one of the things I started doing was I realized that in my calendar as we were kind of blocking out meetings that they were every hour on the hour and they were an hour long. And I realized I would come into the office and before I know it, it was the end of the day and I'm leaving and mm -hmm. I didn't see anybody on my team or in, in the organization. And so I have shortened my meetings to 30 or 45 minutes, still try to keep them on the hour. So that allows me if I then have a break and I'm walking to another office, whatever I have, I know I have a little bit of time to Stop. pop my head in yeah. an office and be like, Hey, what's going on? And that's really good and whatever. But so again, back to one of your points earlier, I'm not calendaring it. Right. It's on my calendar. And so I'm leading through it, yeah. knowing that I've got some opportunity to touch base with that. Now, I think you pose a really good question here, which is how do you do this with remote teams? Mm -hmm. And, um, and I've heard people with some creative solutions around, you know, Zoom meetings and they just pop in. Some are not business, some are. I know one executive that will say, hey, I have open door policy from two to four on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And what she does is she sits at her home office while she's working, but keeps Zoom up and people can pop in there hmm. and just check in. Like and that. it's, and like it's that. something that, so you, you got to get creative, but man, I think this is, I think this is huge to, being a developer of people to, mm -hmm. to making sure that you're practicing leadership on a daily basis. I like the ad there about it's, you added a, a leadership moment to something already on your calendar. Yeah. Getting out about yeah. It. Very Love good. that. Uh, the last I'm listening. One, I'm paying attention. Yeah. Uh, last one. Number five, I just said uh, to delegate more. Um, <laughs> are you doing too much? Uh, that's what I asked this uh, senior leader is, are you doing too much? Are there things other people could be doing? And the big question that we've always, we've loved it here for a, a long time is, are you doing the things that only you can do? That's right. Or are you doing a bunch of things that others could do? Because if, if you're doing so much that you don't have time to lead your people, that's a problem. Yeah. We're not trying to get you to a point of a leader where you're unloading everything that you're doing and delegating this to Perry's point. There are certain things that only you can be doing. I want to challenge you. This is a question I'm starting to ask myself more and more, which is as I go through an activity, a project, something we're working on asking myself who on my team or inside our organization would actually enjoy doing this more than I would, mm. or is more qualified to do this than I am. And then reaching out and say, hey, would you be interested in, would you help with this? But, and more than likely, they're going to say yes, especially if I know it fits into their skill set. Um, like for you, around writing and studying and learning content or, or speaking, you know, like you told me numerous times, hey, listen, you have a busy schedule. If there's an organization that wants a, you to come do a keynote um, as a value add, just pick up the phone. Like, I love doing that. I'll go do that, right? And so that is, in essence, delegating, but it's really kind of partnering in a way that everything that's on your plate into something that the other person may enjoy or is better skilled at than you to be able to do that. And I just, uh, maybe you comment briefly on, uh, I know you've got a great administrative partner now. And yeah. I, know I, say, I notice a lot of execs sometimes, the more senior they are, the better they are at this, but uh, early on, it's tough to leverage, hmm. appropriately leverage. And I know you're you're new. Angie's kind of new to the team. And um, what have you learned about leveraging an administrative partner that helps with this juggling of doing the right things? That's a great question. So remember, I, I mentioned just a little bit ago about me spending kind of a day away on the business. So I created this document that was several pages long. That was the Goody manifesto. Uh, yeah, I could be. It's gonna be a, yeah, I'm going to send it into our publishing company, by the way, if you have a book idea and we have a publishing company. And what I did was I just kind of data dumped onto this document. Yeah. And then I categorized it. Um, and, and then I put it by priority back to what I was telling you about like, okay, so some of the priorities have shift. So I've had to move some things around and Hey, this is a priority and this is what I was thinking. And so I have this massive document. So she took that document and created it into a kind of a form. And now we're going through and she's saying, okay, when does this need to be completed? Who can help you with this project? What does that look like? How can I take that off your plate? And so she's helping me think through that process. And that has been huge for me mm -hmm. to be able to, to do that. The other thing that she's doing is, you know, she'll every day say, Hey, what, what happened yesterday that I need to be aware of or that I can help you with moving forward? Cause then she'll hear me talk about it and she'll be like, don't you think Perry could probably help us do that a little bit quicker than maybe you could and better by the way. <laughs> and so just be, being able to kind of 
she understands the leadership concept of this and to be, have somebody that can hold me accountable to that. Yeah, I'm loving that. Is really helping me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially when it, a pile of stuff comes your way. You'll well, be like, I noticed, Gee. I just noticed that all the podcast recordings for the rest of the year are all magically on listen, my calendar all of a listen. sudden. That never happens. Yeah. yeah. There are a lot of things that people are like, Cody, what's yeah, going on? No, but it's, it's important to, when you're talking about not having time for things, are you pro appropriately leveraging your administrative partners to, to hold 100%. you 100%. I love that. So. Yeah, 100%. Well, as we wrap up, let me let me come back to the five things that Perry brought to us, not the 12, we'll stay with 12. Although, as you do wrap up, I want you to I want you to rephrase that quote that you led, led, led with because I think it's just so powerful for us as leaders. But as we wrap up, here's what we talked about. If you want to get to a place to where you have the ability to find time for leadership, if that's really what we're going to stay with, we want to make sure that when you have a busy calendar, you're thinking about a couple of things. Practice calendar blocking and then protect it. Number two, be clear about what your priorities are. So what gets put on the calendar is in the rank of your priorities. Number three, man, schedule your one-on-ones with your team, with your people. Uh, management by walking around is number four. And then the last one that we just talked about is how do you delegate more? And not just to delegate. You heard Perry and I talk a little bit bantering back and forth. It's more than just saying, I have a to do, so I'm going to give it to, uh, to dumb. That's dumping. That's dumping, not delegating. To dump <laughs> on somebody else. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, it's much deeper than that. Yeah, it should. Well, thank you for joining. And the quote was that stop trying to add leadership uh, items to your calendar, make leadership moments of the things that are already on your calendar. So good. Uh, if you can do that, you're off to a great start. So what does it take for a leader to be brave enough or wise enough to surround themselves with people who are honest and truthful as they are pursuing their dream? Well, I think it's to be honest first. I think it's to be willing to go first in the area of honesty. I just had a, it, it's so funny because I, I just had a, a series of meetings and, and one of, one of the people in the meeting was, was really giving me a very dismal report, just a really challenging, in my opinion, discouraging report. Hmm. And I looked at this leader and I said, Hey, can I ask you a question? Is your attempt here to level set me, to discourage me or to encourage me? And I said, you may have a fourth option. I don't know, but that's the three that comes to mind. Level set me, discourage me, or encourage me. <laughs> and the leader sat back for a moment and went, I think it was to discourage you because I feel discouraged right now. Well, I was waiting for them so with honest. great candor and confidence. I was waiting for them to say it was just meant to level set you because that was the easy way, right? That's the right. that's the answer of a five out of scale of one and ten. Right. You know, exactly. You don't have an opinion. Neutral. And so and so I went, I really fully thought they were going to say to level set me. But my comeback to that was going to be, well, I already knew these numbers and you know I know these numbers. Mm -hmm. So I was ready for the answer that I thought. When right. this person says, I think it was discourage you because I discourage you, I'm going to tell mm -hmm. you what happened, Tracy. My respect level for this leader went through the sky, yes. through the roof, and here's why. I realized I had somebody that would be honest with themselves and also honest with me. Yes. Now, you know why they did that? It's because I paused and I put them on the spot because I wanted to know because it was not advantageous to the meeting. So as a leader, I led them through candor and I got candor back or I led them through trust and I got trust back. See, when John says and when he's talking about dropping a plot, he was really talking about this this concept that he says more people fought it. You'll remember last week, those of you that have listened to last week, you'll remember when we talked about the family members and others that just did not catch it and they really began to discourage us. What John's saying here is, no, no, it's gone beyond it. You've already got it. You've got it. But guess what? People are not happy that you got it. Mm -hmm. You're on your way. In fact, there's tangible results. You're starting to experience your dream. And now you got the people that's going, ooh, they're like the crab that wants to pull you back down with the rest of them because mm -hmm. they don't want you. They don't want you to get out of the bucket. So you've got a little bit of experience and rather than surrounding yourself with people that are excited for you, it's people that fly over and plop on you because, because why? I don't know. So ask them, hey, what, why are you raining on my parade right now? 
Yeah. What, what are you trying to accomplish? And I have found the people that will respond well to that. I can trust them. Mm-hmm. I didn't, when this leader told me that, I was like, are you hearing what you're saying? You're trying to discourage me. <laughs> I didn't go, man, you got to be kidding me. You discouraged. I'm discouraged. I went, no. I said, thank you for telling me that. Mm-hmm. Now let's get encouraged together. Right. The leader came up to me. In fact, I was a little late here, uh, Tracy, to, to the recording today. The leader came up to me after says, I don't think I have ever been handled so well when I was feeling discouraged and I wanted somebody else to be discouraged with me. Mm-hmm. I will do better next time. Mm-hmm. Said, Touchdown. Yeah. Because of a candid conversation with somebody that was absolutely raining on my parade. <laughs> about right. why. And mm-hmm. then they too wanted to change that and fix that and become better themselves. Mm -hmm. Why I love stories and why we are fleshing out and adding stories to these lessons. This lesson, again, is very similar other than the plop story. Uh, These don't have really applicate. These are unique stories or lessons for John in that they don't come with applications. John is such an application guy. And so we are fleshing out these stories. Why I love this story that you just told is because we have all been you and we have all been the other person in your story. Yeah, and yeah. every person listening can identify with, hey, you know, sometimes when we feel bad, it's annoying when someone is ch- upbeat and positive and we're looking through negative goggles. And so right. sometimes, you know, that hurting people hurt people. That's when we become that person. And it's so wonderful when someone handles us in a way or or relates with us in a way that helps us to rise, which is what you did. And I think that's the lesson in that story right there is we can do that rather than be put out. You could have been put out and annoyed with that person on your team. You know, you could have pulled rank as the boss. You could have said, we don't have that kind of attitude in our team meetings. We don't have that. You know what? Don't please don't bring that here or whatever. But you handle that person with honesty and transparency, which gave them the freedom to be honest and transparent. So then that to me is a lesson of what kind of leader are we being that we allow our team members to be open and transparent when they're feeling not so great when they show up to a team meeting when ideally they should be positive? Yeah. Um, so thank you for sharing that uh, because discouragement is catchy, but yeah. so encouragement can be catchy too. Today's topic we're going to talk about is priority principles for leaders. And I have to tell you, when I saw priority principles, I almost didn't want to talk about it because this is something that um, I struggle with. I'm continuing to grow and continuing to learn, but it's not who gets the most things done. Although I do like to create a, a checklist and see how many lines by the end of the day I can have on my piece of paper, but it's about who gets the right things done, um, who really wins at the end of the day. And so really thinking about what are those right things? What are the desired outcomes and results that we need. And so today we're going to look at five principles. You guessed it. (laughs) Our favorite number of how do you become a really a leader that that understands how to prioritize the things that need to get done. Yeah. And I don't break it to you. You're not the only one struggling with this. Uh, Don't take your hand off the wheel where you are right now, but show of hands, how many of you struggle with um, being busy, but busy doing what? Uh, That was my uh, little motto for years. Perry, I know you're busy, but busy doing what? Because it's no... if. It's almost like a, an honor badge now that we get by being busy. We want everybody to know how busy we are. But am I actually working on important things? And, uh, you know, I get done at the end of the day. I said I had a very busy day. Did you, did you, I got a lot done. Did, did any of it matter? Not not one thing. Yeah. Uh, but I got a lot done. I, I want to get the right things done. So that's, that's where I, I thought we'd look at some of this, again, from some of John's teaching that really resonated with me. I've been applying it. I'm teaching it a lot. We're doing a lot of leaders asking for help in coaching yeah. on how to get manage time. They usually say time management, but it really is priority management and, and knowing what the what your priorities are and working those. Yeah, because we uh, we all know that we can't manage time. It's going to happen, but you can uh, lead your priorities in the right way. So let's talk about these priority principles that we have for you today. Number one, working smarter has a higher return than working harder. Mm-hmm. And again, you may go, well, that makes sense. I, I, I understand that. But I think when we begin to think about what we're doing and what we need to accomplish as a leader uh, and we begin to go this way and begin to work smarter implies that we're becoming more efficient. We're becoming more effective versus um, just putting in more time. Now, you and I will roll up our sleeves and we were talking about before we started recording today about 
well, I mean, I just got to leave, you know, a couple hours early. I got to leave the night before. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to do whatever. That may not be the best thing as a leader, depending on what the priority is. And I think if we think about optimizing our workflow, if we think about focusing on the highest return of some of the things we need to get done, could we be leveraging technology? Uh, Jake was just talking to us a little bit before we started about one of the things that he's been able to take off your plate mm-hmm. that you can then rearrange your priorities because of some technology that he is using. Versus if if we don't go that route, the age old burnout, which we've heard a lot of people talk about this. I think when you get down that road and if you're not doing this, you're just going to get diminishing returns as a leader. And ultimately, it's about balance. That's extremely hard. Mm. As I sit here and smile at you for those that aren't on YouTube watching us talk about balance. <laughs> but man, we really need to continue to think about as a leader, are we working smart? Did you just say I was being replaced by technology? Well, I didn't want to tell you that, but Jake and I, we're, we're going to get there. Wow. This was just the yeah. first thing. Yeah. 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 Okay. But right. there are things, right, that are coming out and about that we can use and leverage, not replace. I don't think it'll ever replace the human Okay. Uh, element of what we do. That doesn't make me feel any better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this working smarter makes me think about big rocks first. And yeah. uh, Stephen Covey's great lesson around if, you, if you're filling your time with the, the pebbles and the stones, you can't get the big rocks done. So get figure out <clears throat> what your big rocks are, what your priorities are, and do those first, and then you, then fill in around that with what's left. Uh, number two was an interesting <laughs> this is a statement. Some you can't have it all, and the, if you're like us, you say. What? Why not? <laughs> yeah. Why not? What? <laughs> what was that about? Uh, yes, yeah, it's, it's easy to go into the day, to the week, to the month to think I'm going to get it all done, and it just doesn't happen that way. So you, uh, if you're trying to get everything done, if everything's a priority, then nothing's a priority. So uh, figuring out what are and I've you know there's all kind of methodologies for doing this that just practically looking at what you need to get done in a week or a month and saying, what are my top A priorities? And what would be secondary, a B priority? And then what would be a C? And I never do a B before I finish my A's. I never do a C before I finish my B's. Will I ever get to my C's? Perhaps not. If if I takes, if I'm still working on A's and then B's, I may not get to those, but I know what the next ones are, but I don't jump to them to do that. And for me, this is really about saying I, I'm probably not going to get it all done. Uh, work is going to expand to fill all the time I give it. So let's just figure out what needs to be done and get that most important stuff done and don't worry about all of it. Leaders, you know better than anyone that growth is essential if you want to make tomorrow better than today. But fitting growth into your calendar takes intentionality and self-discipline. So. Let Maxwell Leadership help make your growth achievable. You're invited to join thousands of worldwide leaders in using the Maxwell Leadership Growth Plan. The Maxwell Leadership Growth Plan provides you with convenient and easy to implement leadership resources, including video lessons from John Maxwell, all at your fingertips. Available in our Maxwell Leadership app or online, You'll be coached by many well-known leadership experts that will help you achieve your growth goals. You can even listen to this podcast right there in the app. Check it out for free today at growth.maxwellleadership.com. That's growth.maxwellleadership.com. I love what you're saying. I, I went through an exercise a couple weeks ago where... I listed out everything that I had on my mind and every kind of thing, project that we're working on and what's going on. And then I went through and I, I ranked them on paper and categorized them to your point and, and by priority because I do want to accomplish it all. As, as an achiever, you're like, hey, I can get all of this done. And that's not realistic. And so kind of developed a system to help fight myself, mm-hmm. you know, in that because you can't have it all. And there are things that I continue to just pin Right. I just leave on there or table uh, from week to week because and it's been several weeks. And to your point, I may never get to it. But just understanding and seeing what that priority filter is uh, has brought to my attention that I can't get it all done uh, right now. The third one is the good is always the enemy of the best. I think if if in this uh, it makes me think about a couple of things, you know, where if things are good, uh, maybe we get a little bit to content with the way that things are going. We don't take risks. Um, 
We don't invest in different things for our business, for our team. Uh, we're less likely to want to change. By the way, if you don't like change, uh, you will uh, not last very long. And so you'll like your relevance a whole lot less, as we've said here before. <laughs> I also think if we continue to just be content and stay in the good, we're missing out on our full potential. Yeah. And, um, and so it's got to be a priority of ours to make sure that we're continuing to strive. And for me, it's really having that mindset of growth. And so what am I doing to grow so that I'm not staying in the good? I was listening to a recording of John the other day, and he was telling a story about being new in communication and as a uh, young pastor, and he realized that he he could just kind of mail it in. He could he could kind of wing it, uh, and that the, the people in his congregation didn't have that high of expectation, and he could meet whatever they had. And he decided right then that um, that being good is the enemy of being great, and that he would um, actually take it to the next level to mm-hmm. to raise it to be great to focus on the things that only he could do to focus on the great things to be not all the, the the dozens of good things you could be doing or complacency may sit in but to really figure out what are the big high impact things that's good. I can be doing so for me that's when when I thought about that one it was around sometimes you could just settle it's good enough no nope, I'm going to pick pick out a couple of things that make impact and work on those and let the good things uh, go for that's now good. which is you can't have it all Number four, I want to play with you a little game here about uh, uh, back and forth off this. But um, the idea was uh, simple. It says that uh, proactive beats reactive Mm -hmm. when it comes to being productive. Proactive beats reactive. And so a little little word association. I I gave you some ideas here, but I'll take the the proactive side, which is really an initiator. And by the way, leaders always initiate. Uh, leaders don't wait for things to come. Leaders initiate. So if, if I'm thinking about being productive, and this goes back to uh, John's Today Matters, but I love this. I think about it all the time. Initiators, we prepare. What do, what do the reactors do? Clean up messes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the word here is repair. But, man, ultimately, uh, it, if you're reacting, you're ended up cleaning up stuff. You haven't really kind of had the 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 lens of what could be yep. and then you end up getting yourself in trouble yeah, repairing what you didn't do yesterday yeah. you get to, yeah. to do it today uh, on that uh if i'm an initiator i plan ahead <laughs> and if i'm a reactor i live for the moment <laughs> and i say that with a smile because i uh i am not like that uh, but i do have some people in my life and on my team that are uh, like that and for me i just think that they um are things you can miss out on if you don't plan ahead. If I'm an initiator, I pick up the phone and make contact. If I'm a reactor, I just wait for the phone to ring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. If I'm an initiator, I anticipate problems. And then as a reactor, I just react to the problems that, that show up on my plate. And um, I'll tell you, this is one thing right here for me that I love with people that are that I work with and on my team is that if we are all thinking and anticipating problems Mm -hmm. ahead of time and sharing those, then I am hearing from my team and those around me things that I hadn't even thought about that helps me anticipate. And so love being around people that that anticipate the problems. Totally agree. If I'm proactive and I initiate, I, I, I seize the moment. And as I'm reacting, I just wait for the right moment. If I'm an initiator, I put priorities uh, in mm-hmm. my calendar. And if I react, I put others' requests in their calendars. In, in yeah, the, talk a little bit, talk a little bit about 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 this one from your lens. <laughs> yeah, that you're, uh, uh, you know, you put the request in your in your calendar. It should read, but you you're uh, when people come and make a request of you. You start scheduling your time, and putting yeah. things out <clears throat> versus putting my priorities in my calendar first. Yeah, but. like even just thinking about this podcast, right? Like. One of the things, this is a priority to us. And um, we have some team around us that helps us with this. And it, one of the things that we wanted to initiate was, hey, we've, we've got to make this a priority. We've got to get this on our calendar. And so we have it calendar out all the way for the whole year so that yeah. we know that we can make sure that this is a priority and it's in our calendar and we don't allow other things to detract Good. from it. Love that. Initiators, I would invest time in people. And as a reactor, I would spend time with people. This right here stands yeah. out to me yeah. in regards to level four influence. We yeah. talk about at level four, 
You know, what are you doing to develop people personally and professionally? And it's not just about spending time with them. You begin to develop people when you invest time in them. And it's just a, it's a different mindset. I love that too. I think the same thing is that when I'm in those precious one-on-one moments, when you're, when you have time with people, are you just spending time, you know, talking about menial things or are you actually investing time and talking about meaningful things? And finally, if I'm an initiator, I choose. And as a reactor, I lose. <laughs> yeah. So I love that. And I love that we kind of shared that. And that'll be in the, the learner's guide. Yes. And you can download it and see that chart there that's uh, from John. Well, number five is we want to talk about the important needs to take precedent over the urgent. And obviously, this leads right into the Eisenhower matrix that we're all very familiar with. If not, uh, take take a look at that. And that is where we talk about, hey, the important and the urgent, the not important, and the not urgent, and what what are you? What is on your plate? What priorities do you have, and where does it fall in that bucket? And I would encourage you not only to do this as an individual, but to do this with your team. You know, the purpose of the content we bring with you is to help you lead and develop your team and and that team co. He said this is a great exercise mm. to have your team walk through where everybody's putting things that they're on the board and which category does it fall into because hey. There's a couple of things that may need to be eliminated off that. And it's the probably one of the biggest challenges I see in this topic of being productive is we spend all the time in the urgent and important quadrant, the upper mm-hmm. left, and not in the upper right, which is not urgent but important, is where most of your productivity is going to happen. And uh, I just had a, a huge coaching call yesterday with someone who had not really ever thought about this. But when you and I'll probably do a podcast uh, in the future about this this dastardly uh, little quadrant there called um, not urgent. I mean, not important, but urgent. It's urgent, but not important. And I just noticed that um, a lot of people think everything that if, it, if it's urgent, it has to be important. And it, it starts to dist- distract you from the things that really are important. We talk about working above the line. So at the top of that line there is both uh, important and urgent, important and not urgent. Mm. Below the line, it's not important and urgent, not important and not urgent. So below the line, everything's not important. Above the line, everything's important. Um, how much time are you spending above the line? That's good. If I looked at your calendar uh, and your what you did today, what you're planning to do tomorrow, would it be above the line things? Uh, it's huge um, productivity gain That's if great. you can work above the line. Welcome to the Maxwell Leadership Executive Podcast, where our goal is to help you increase your reputation as a leader, increase your ability to influence others, and increase your ability to fully engage your team to deliver remarkable results. 